TJ Podcast. Okay, guys, welcome back to our feature presentation here. And uh, today we've got a very special guest on. We say that each and every time we have a guest, but I, I guess I really mean it this time. Uh, this is uh, Steve Burns. You know, Steve Burns is one of those types of traders that's out there on social media in the public lexicon. Uh, he's in my, you know, Twitter feed almost every single day as well. And he's one of the best followers you're ever going to find at S. Joseph Burns on Twitter is here to join us to talk about trader psychology and teaching beginners and the whole business in general. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing great today. I'm glad you're having me on. Yeah, there's several things I want to get down to. In fact, we got a lot of stuff I want to get to here today. But number one is you love social media. You're on Twitter all the time. Is that a business strategy? Did you kind of just fall into it? Is it something that you just are naturally good at? Well, what got you so big on Twitter? It's uh, funny how I uh, fell into that because I started just as a hobby. You know, I enjoyed uh, uh, texting people. I thought, well, this is pretty amazing. I can text with the world. So I thought it was an amazing communication platform. So I started as a hobby and it sort of morphed, uh, morphed into a platform where uh, I've got a, a big uh, audience base and I enjoy uh, sharing a uh, uh, stream of thoughts and uh, sharing quality content. It's uh, become a game in itself that I've really enjoyed uh, doing. Yeah. You know, and I'll tell you, and if you're out there and you're listening to our, our interview right now, you know us uh, at Trading Justice. We're pretty real, pretty direct, just want to bring value. That's what Steve does. One thing I love about the way you approach education in the financial market, Steve, is that you're very direct. It's just value. 99% of the time, you're just talking about what you're seeing in the markets or ideas that you're having. And uh, bringing that kind of uh, value into a feed like Twitter, I think is amazing. Uh, and uh, we follow you over there at Tackle Trading on Twitter, and you're at S. Joseph Burr. I'd recommend everybody out there listening, make sure you give Steve a follow. Uh, but today I want to talk about the mindset that we can build into new traders. Because Steve, one thing I find you particularly good at is teaching beginners and teaching the mindset that beginners need to hear. What is the number one challenge somebody who just kind of walks into a trading class is going to have, do you think? Uh, they have trouble with the nature of uncertainty. They always think there's some holy grail where they, they don't understand it's not a 100% win rate. There's no sport where you hit every, every, every ball, you sink every uh, shot in basketball, you don't score a touchdown every time. And people have some delusion to think that a really good trader can predict a non-existent future and can give them 100% win rate, which is just uh, absurd. It doesn't happen in any industry, so I don't know why they think it would happen in trading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Uncertainty and then uh, the lack of understanding when you do get inconsistent results. You know, as a veteran, you understand drawdowns, you know, equity curves, uh, the fact that we're going to lose even good systems. It doesn't matter how good you are at this. You're going to go through periods where you lose money on any system. And I think beginners really struggle with that because they've not lived through it, right? It's a lack of context. They've not dealt with volatility and watching their accounts go down four or 5% and realizing that's just a part of the business. So do you think data helps with this, Steve? Do you think uh, just try to show them the numbers? Like how do you uh, tackle that challenge? Yeah, I think they, they have to know the data on their system. Like you said, the analytics of a, a strategy. You know, whether it's a back test where you see what your average win rate will be, it's much easier to trade when you know you're going to, you know, win six times and lose four out of a 10 trade uh, sample and you're going to lose a percent of your capital on your losers. You might make two or 3% on your winners and that's where the profit is going to come from. It's really important they have a full understanding of how their strategy or system operates based on uh, data. You know, in a risk reward ratio, they know where they're going to stop out at and where their upside uh, profit potential is as well. But a lot of them don't even have the strategy to even know the data on. So if they're really, if they're just swinging blind with their own opinions and predictions, they're really going to be in trouble because there is no psychological cure for that uncertainty. Do you think that anybody can be good at this if they don't like numbers? <laughs> I think Richard Dennis uh, tried to prove that anybody could be turned into a trader, but the, the traders were good at numbers. I mean, I think that's a basic skill that they, you have to have yeah. is understanding mm -hmm. the mathematical. I mean, everything, especially the winning system, understanding the math of, of drawdowns and trying to come out of a drawdown and the math of the best case scenario returns. If you don't have 
the language of math. I think it's uh, almost impossible. Well, and you don't have to have a PhD and be a quant uh, kind of algorithmic based trader coming right out of MIT working on Wall Street. That's not what we're saying right. here, right. obviously. But you have to at least understand percentages, mathematics, uh, how compounding can become so powerful. The idea behind numbers, I, I, I've never understood that. I've heard that a few times in my career, Steve, being an educator and uh, where, oh, I don't like math. And I'm just thinking, how do you <laughs> not like numbers? I don't get that. <laughs> that but say la vie, I guess, uh, the, for, to each their own, right? Um, go ahead. Yeah, you're going to need uh, no numbers to know your wins and losses because you need to enjoy your wins at least with math. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's easier to teach people high probability systems where they're going to be right a lot? Or is it easier to teach them systems where they're going to be 50-50 but have, you know, good reward to risk ratios? Because I know there's dynamically different models here, right? You can go for those low delta, high probability theta systems, or mm -hmm. you can go out and learn how to day trade, swing trade, and actually have to read a chart, but you're not going to be right all the time. Do you think most people like being right more or just want to make money? Well, I think most people do like to be right more. That's why they don't make money. I mean, I, everyone I've seen, even the professionals to uh, the people I've worked with, I mean, a 60%, 65% win rate is a great win rate for trading. And it's, uh, it's the best psychological thing to be able to accept the small losses and the percentage of losses because anybody that goes in wanting a high probability system, they always tend to hold the losers too long and create the big losses because they want to be right so bad. You know, I just want to be right big and wrong small, so I don't really uh, have a big concern about being uh, wrong a few times in a row or having a losing streak because I know I catch the big trends and that's where the money comes from. But I've seen it's very dangerous psychological for someone to want the high win rate system, which this is what I found personally. Yeah, I think you can get into trouble if you feel like you got to be right every time because then uh, there's something in the emotions behind why you need that to where you're going to have a hard time managing it when you're wrong. You know, and every system can turn against you, correct? Yeah, and, and I don't know any system, even a high probability win rate system is going to have losing streaks. So it's dangerous to have small wins and then a losing streak causes a bigger drawdown than if you had some big wins to offset it. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. You know, I think I hear my brother Mark there in the background. Mark, you're a big data guy. You love numbers and systems as well. I mean, uh, this whole idea behind math, Mark, that probably – it strokes your, your inner nerd oh, there, no, doesn't no. it? Are you kidding? Like, I, and I thought I was on mute, so you probably heard me grunting <laughs> when Steve was talking. And what I was grunting at, as, as, it was like I was like beating myself up. Because like, like one of the things that drives me in life is be the best, be the best. And with trading, I associate that so often with being right. And so when Steve was talking about that, I was like, oh, you are so guilty of that. You're mm -hmm. so guilty of like wanting to be right more than wanting to make money. And so like, it was just resonating with me internally there. Yeah. I think we all want to win, you know, and uh, if you define winning in the markets as having a positive equity curve and being in control of your risk, who cares what the win loss rate is as long as your accounts are growing over time. And there's so many different systems that can achieve that, Steve, but the process of taking a beginner, who doesn't know any of these terms. By the way, if somebody walked in on the street and listened to our conversation right now, they're going to think trading is impossibly hard, right? And I, I always feel like one of the challenges is building people up enough to make them realize they can learn how to trade and it can be life-changing, but also beating them down enough to make them realize that it's not a get-rich-quick thing and it's not going to be easy, right? So how do you confront that? How do you build people's confidence to where they want to try this but to make sure you remind them it's going to take some time and you've got to learn these skill sets. Yeah. I think I try to focus on, you know, the system itself, like what is their system? You know, what's, what can they expect to begin with? And, and especially starting with, you know, if you, you're making 20% of your returns, you're among the greatest traders in the world, even at the highest professional level, even George, the George Soros and the Warren Buffett's that are investors and traders, the best in the world average about 20% a year over the long periods of time. They have some great years, you know, I think Minervini had some 100% years as a stock trader. I mean, it, it does happen. Those are outliers. But for normal people, 20% is a great annual return. And that really uh, has to be sunk in to begin with because it depresses people. Yeah. You know, I've had a few 40% years or 50% years myself over the last 25 years, but I took on risk to, to get that. And you have to, the, the, the higher you want your returns, the more risk you will take on to get those returns and the drawdowns will be bigger. It's better to have a good controlled position sizing you know, into into just rack up the the, cap, the the equity curve slowly and ramp it up, but having reasonable expectations is the first step in that. 
I always tell people get rich slow, you know, and 20% a year at 2% a month is an incredible return. You're doing an amazing job. There's no question about it. You can get there, by the way, uh, with your skills. And if you're running a small account out there, that can be a little frustrating because let's say, Steve, you got 25 grand, 20% is what, five grand, you know? So you're like, well, Tim, that doesn't change my life, but it does change your life if it's repeatable and you do it over and over and over again. And and that phrase I use all the time, get rich slow. I'm glad you bring up percentages, by the way, because again, with numbers, I think it's important to talk numbers. Uh, can a new trader in a couple of years of education get to a point where they're, they're hitting 20% a year, Steve? Oh, yeah. I've, I've, uh, yeah, absolutely. I had 20% a year for a long time early on, you know, thanks to the internet bubble and the great stock market in the 90s. You know, if you've got a good process in place and you can catch some nice trends in the right areas of the market, you can get 20%. I mean, that's not... Uh, you know, I thought it was pretty normal when I was doing it. A lot of other people were shocked, you know, when I talked to them about it. But I've had a lot of uh, great win streaks with year, uh, year over year, 20%, 20%. So it's very possible. But you have to manage your risk and your downside because when the March 2000 hits or the, the 2008 hits, you have to be able to lock in your profits and know how to get to the sidelines if you need to and uh, lock in the profits. But, you know, the unrealistic expectations I always find so funny because of the, the crazy stuff you see online and with the uh, – the trading gurus that uh, claim stuff and, and have uh, fancy sports cars and mansions. And, <laughs> and uh, Bernie Madoff, all he offered was a little bit over 1% a month consistently. He was able to uh, milk billions and billions out of the out of the market and people because they were dying for a 1% a month return. That really shows you how hard the returns really are. Yeah, there's no question, especially the bigger you get at institutional levels, it's a lot uh, harder to hit those big numbers. And I I do think it's important that we bring up that thing about the online environment. I see a lot of bullshit out there, quite frankly. (laughs) I just do. And it drives me crazy because the markets, they're life changing, you know, if you do them correctly. And it's not an instant fix. And there's no such thing as get rich quick. Uh, It takes hard work, dedication, skills, consistency, you got to understand what the products are that you're using. You got to understand the math behind it and be willing and understand the risk that you're taking on to get there. But all that being said, all those disclaimers, which are accurate, the markets are amazing. And then you go online, and I'm in the industry, Steve. And I see the garbage out there about, you know, sports cars and fancy mansions and traveling all over the world, like Instagram stuff. And it just, it makes me sick. I I really hate that part of it. How do we fight that when we know we're bringing value to people, uh, but you're in an industry that is kind of, you know, it's got that ugly side of it too, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. The first thing I do when uh, people approach me for silliness, you know, like trying to trade for a living with a few thousand dollars or uh, what can, you know, so many people, even friends and family, you know, I've got a few hundred dollars. What can you do with it? You know, I can give it back to you and wish you well. I mean, <laughs> Here's you that. have to be properly capitalized to actively trade. Now, if you don't have the capital, then you need to probably be uh, doing some long-term trend following systems, you know, dollar cost averaging into a 401k at your work and getting a match you know, and building up your capital that way. I mean, active trading takes a large capital base to really begin at least, you know, in the tens of thousands to really do it correctly. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, and and until you are properly capitalized, there's really two simple things that any beginner can kind of wrap their head around and still get excited about the markets. Reinvesting your profit. So Mm -hmm. until you've got the big account, don't pull any money out. If you make money, leave it in there and reinvest it. And then number two is I would continue to fund your account with maybe a couple hundred bucks from your paychecks, things like that. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a funding strategy and a reinvestment strategy when you're working with an account, in my opinion, less than 50K. You know, that's kind of what I usually tell people uh, because those are powerful things when done correctly, Steve. You make a little money, reinvest it. You put a little bit more money in there. It allows you to grow into the bigger accounts and into that longer term vision of what you want to achieve, right? Yeah, I I agree 100% with what you're saying. That's what I did. You know, you don't have to try to become financially independent overnight. But if, like you said, you started with a small capital base, like I did when I was young, I built it, compounded it, grew it, you know, did what I had to do, like you said, to not have to touch it for a long time until I did become financially independent. I mean, it's uh, incredible what you can do. It's possible. I mean, by uh, March of 2000, I was uh, 27 years old and my my, uh, stock market account equaled what my house payoff was when I was 27 years old. Wow. I mean, so, I mean, after that, you're hooked forever. You're never going to not be hooked after you see you can either pay a 30-year mortgage for 30 years or you can have a great bull market run over 
a nine year period, you know, yeah. and have the same capital. And once you get up to a good amount of capital, which is what was my goal was that you can really make some huge returns. 10%, you know, on a three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar account is, is a nice return. I'm pretty good with numbers. I did some quick math there. If you were 27 in 2000, that means you were born in 73. You're my brother Mark's age. <clears throat> yeah, you're, uh, yeah I'm, uh, I'm 40. I turned 40 this year. I've been in markets since 2005. I got very interested after I went through college, but you were telling me before we got on the show here today, you were interested even before you, you know, got out of high school. You, you got started in markets at like 15, 16 years old. Is that right? Well, I got, I got started research them. I couldn't have an actual account until I was 18, but, but I, I remember distinctly uh, a person brought around some insurance, uh, insurance thing. I don't know if it was uh, what it was pushing, but it was uh, like probably a whole life savings account uh, form that showed the compounding of capital over a 30, 40 year period. I remember sitting, I was working in a shoe store part time in 1988, maybe. And I remember sitting down looking at that compound capital table going, my gosh, so if I had this money now and I get to this much money, then the return on that would be more than I'm making. I remember that inspired me at 16 years old. So I was able to start participating in the market as quickly as I could. No, and I think that's a really powerful thing, quite frankly, Steve, is the idea of understanding the long-term potential returns from investing. You know, uh, I remember, you know, sitting some new traders down recently where I talked to them about this is what a hundred bucks is worth, or this is what a thousand bucks is worth. And because when you're a new trader with a smaller account, it can be deflating emotionally to realize you're not going to make a living from this right away. But as a veteran trying to influence and also trying to inspire those people, I want them to understand the value of building these skill sets. And that long-term thinking is incredibly powerful when you adopt it and truly understand that compounding effect of the way that it works. You know, one thing that we work a lot on, you know, with our community is helping people build a daily routine and a process to trading. What is your personal daily routine in the markets? I mean, are you a morning guy? Do you get up early, kind of check the futures market? How do you approach it? Yeah, I look at futures when they open at night. I mean, it's just a lot of it's just to gauge what's going on. I, I, I use end of day signals almost exclusively now because I like the quality of life when I'm just trading the end of day with swing signals or trend trading signals. I don't have to sit at the screen for seven and a half, eight hours a day and look at all the different inter intraday noise. You know, the high frequency traders and the algos can go wild intraday. And uh, my position sizing keeps me pretty safe. I very rarely have any emergency stop losses with the right position sizing and looking at the volatility of what I'm trading. So I, uh, you know, look at the open, see what's going on, gauge it. And then I go live my life. And then, uh, at the end of the day, I come back and, uh, and in the last 30, in the last hour to 30 minutes, I'll go go through all my charts, all my watch list and see if any signals are being triggered. So I'll exit with profits. If my targets are hit and they reverse or my trailing stop is hit or I stop loss is hit, I'll exit at the end of the day. And I have about a, keep about a 20 item watch list, and about 10 in reserve. So a lot of my trading is done in about 30 minutes a day. You know, if you're a veteran and you're listening, think of the key words you just heard, you know, routine, process, watch list, uh, trend following, you know, triggers. I mean, these are things that you have to know how to do in your own system. And it sounds like being an end of day trader, watch list based trader, and, uh, you know, going for that 50, 60% win rate, you're probably a trend following trader, Steve, position trader. Is that right? Yeah, I've, I've morphed more into a swing trader in recent years because it's been more swings than that many long-term trends overall. So mm -hmm. we say a, a swing trader over a, I haven't had very many trades more than a few weeks or a, or a month in a while. That's interesting. You know, out of the four types, day trader, swing trader, position trader, and investor, uh, what do you think is the easiest one to teach and which one's the most difficult? Oh, investor is pretty simple overall. I mean, it can be very painful during bear markets, but overall, just, you know, being an investor, I mean, that's what I started out at, trying to build capital. I investing in tech mutual funds in the early 90s and thought, you know, tech was where to be. And I just stumbled into it really by accident. So I returned some great returns as a, as a tech investor in the, in the early 90s and uh, have evolved. I think uh, trend following to me with, you know, shorter term trend following, trend trading, is a more comfortable thing because you can get in and get out. You're not sitting through big drawdowns or bear markets. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the reason most people get into the business? Is it just uh, greed making money every day? Do you think they're getting in for income? What, what pulls people into the interest of the trading the markets? I think they all start out thinking it's easy money. They see the opportunity. It's just their eyes glaze over with the, the opportunity and they think they can make a lot of money quickly. 
and uh, you know multiply their money, and that's what drives people initially. Most people. And what uh, causes most of those people to to fail within their first year? Oh, two? definitely, definitely risk management, position sizing. They go all in, you know, way too big, especially if they're doing options or they're doing penny stocks, or they're doing small volatile small caps or pink sheet stocks, and they just blow up. I mean, because once you get 50% down, you have to double your money to get back to even. And if you can't, if you're going to lose 50%, the odds are slim, you're going to be able to double after such a loss. Yeah. It really breaks people mentally and emotionally. Yeah, I agree with that. I've seen it too many times. You know, you've got two types. You've got the people who rush right in, jump into the pool before checking if there's water in there, right? And they, <laughs> they want to go long call, long put, and try to make a bunch of money right away. Uh, but then you've also got the trader who won't, you know, put a $100 trade on uh, with even after years of experience because they're so concerned about risk. I know the biggest problem, the, probably the most risky person is the one who's jumping in, you know, over mm -hmm. position sizing, over leveraging. But I've also run into this. As a, as a mentor, traders who won't jump in and take the risk at all, you know, when you have somebody in that situation, how do you deal with that? Yeah, that is an odd phenomenon that I've seen too. Like you said, people read all my books, follow me for years and never put any money at risk. It's uh, like they don't have the skill of taking on the risk and uncertainty. They look for a perfect system, a perfect uh, entry, perfect exits. You know, they critique everything, why something may or may not work. They worry about losing money. And, uh, you know, at some point you have to put everything away and uh, put the risk on because that's really the skill of a trader is take is accepting the uncertainty and putting capital at risk for the chance of a gain because the, all of the reward is based on the risk you're willing to take. And that is a skill in itself. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that 100%. You know, and understanding expectations, I think is so important in life. Uh, there's no question. When somebody starts this journey of learning how to trade the markets, how much time and work do you tell them it's going to take to get good at it? I would say I always tell them about a year. If they're really serious about it, put in a few hours a day, every day, and a year they can have all the basic understandings, have a system built for themselves, have the right position sizing and signals, and start actively trading within a year if they're mm. really, really serious. Yeah, that's kind of where my head's at as well. I usually tell people, I mean, you can get your first live trade on within you know, <laughs> two days if you want to get funded, but that's not going to make you a trader. Yeah. Um, doing basic stock trades, you know, if you're well disciplined and designed and you go through a fast crash, maybe one to three months, right? Uh, cover calls, you know, some simple naked put stuff within six months, but to be a trader, I think you need a year of work, you know, at least a few hours, you know, a day, maybe 10 or 15 hours a week for a year is about right. Because most people do this, they're, they're working full time jobs, right? Oh, yeah. And that's, that's another thing that they can't day trade and they can't look at their phone and work all day. You know, that's another uh, barrier. I mean, I know so many people that have trouble even getting the end of day trading when they're working a full time job. But uh, you know, the barrier to entry is so low. That's why it's so dangerous. You know, you can't go out and play uh, NBA basketball when you want to or, you know, go take a pitch from a major league baseball player. But you can't go trade against professionals if you want to. <laughs> There's just no barrier to entry. That's what costs people so much money. Step on up and try to scalp the futures market. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you can definitely get in there and trade against those algos if you choose. <laughs> Not very wise for most mm -hmm. traders to do that, by the way, uh, if you're listening out there. A couple more things I want to talk to you about, Steve. I always enjoy these kind of conversations with real traders out there. Um, you're from Tennessee, you know, do you, and I'm from Utah, you know, Midwest kind of guys. Do you ever find the image of trading is very negative from a connotation uh, from the people in your life? Do they ever kind of say like, oh, that's that Wall Street stuff, or do you find it's more palatable here in 2019? I think my whole life I've always been looked at as a gambler. I'm just some wild gambler, and I remember uh, some people have come around though when I was young, when everybody didn't see, and I was saying, you know, keep building your capital. I remember people leaving jobs and just taking their 401ks, and like, don't destroy your capital, build it, you know, put it in another account, keep building it. And a lot of people have come around later, but everybody always, you know, dismissed me as a gambler and how can I live that way? And, you know, and it's so risky and all the, the stuff they don't understand. It's like, I'm not in there gambling. I'm in there trying to be the casino. I'm taking yeah. the trades of the gamblers. You know, I'm operating with an edge. I'm not operating as a gambler. They, well, they think a casino is a gambler. A casino is a business with an edge. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you know, the thing about it is any real veteran trader understands it's about risk mitigation, you know, proper position sizing and keeping trades small enough to where it's kind of boring most days, right? Yep. 
markets yeah. shouldn't be exciting. It shouldn't be like a fireworks show where you're watching your account capital go up and down 5% every day. I mean, that, you, that's not sustainable. You'll end up busted out of the entire thing. In yeah. fact, good trading is more, is kind of boring, isn't it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. If you're just operating like a business, you're putting on your trades, taking off your trades, you know, no one trade. Every one trade should be just one of the next 100 if you're position size uh, correctly. Uh, but, uh, you know, over the long term, I look back and I've done everything from day trading and, uh, you know, position trading and swing trading and trend fight, everything. And uh, all my best money was made in trends. All my best money was when I bought a, a great stock. A lot of things that you're know, breaking out to all time highs back in the past and mm -hmm. just sitting on it for weeks and months on end. And that's where a lot of my big returns came from, not sitting at a computer for seven and a half hours a day trying to beat it beat everybody for a few pennies or nickels in the day. I mean, I was looking for the, for the big dollars, not the little nickels and dimes during the day trading. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's many, many different processes and mindsets to that. Some of my best uh, months and some of my best conditions I've ever traded and I just stack theta and sell options, you know, uh, mm -hmm. but it's also just based on a system I trade myself and that I love. I love selling naked puts on stocks I'm willing to own, right? I love doing cover calls on long-term equity that I hold in my account and just picking mm -hmm. up a little extra credit and cash flow. Uh, and then that trend trading stuff is so easy when you understand it and you're positioned well. Because think about how many of these stocks or industries have just been in juggernaut trends, even in the last couple of years. You know, conservative products like REITs or utilities that you could have just bought and held this year. And they weren't that hard of a trend to identify here, Steve. They've been juggernauts. Uh, in a market where there's uncertainty, defensive products grab attention and the markets break out to new highs. Let me ask you a question on that though. How much of your analysis is based just on the chart versus based on economics and fundamentals? Uh, I would say probably 95% is pure technical. The only thing I use really fundamentally is my stock watch list. I will use uh, some uh, fundamental filters to trade the best stocks on fundamentals. And even then I will also use some more uh, speculative stocks because the Tesla and Amazon were such a uh, shocking moves over the past seven years, you know, without the fundamentals to back them up. But, uh, you know, all, only thing I use fundamentals for is my watch list of stocks. Everything else is pure. And even then I use pure technicals to trade them with. Yeah. Yeah. I think technicals are going to drive the price action and also entry points and all that kind of stuff. Fundamentals have become a little bit bigger role in the way I approach markets in the last couple of years. But at the end of the day, you're not going to trade it until you get a signal. You know, it's just not going to happen. You're not going to buy until you get the breakout where you get the moving averages confirming or whatever it might mm -hmm. be. And there's so many different variations of using those technicals. A couple of things I got to get your take on here. It's the back end of 2019 and we got big news happening in the financial markets. Commission free young man. I mean, uh, TD Ameritrade and Schwab and uh, E-Trade this last week have come out and announced that commissions are pretty much going to be wiped out and gone down to zero as close as you can get it. There's still <laughs> going to be some futures commissions and option commissions in most of them. But that's big news for the market, for our industry and for the marketplace in general. Do you think it's going to impact the way you approach trading? Uh, I, I might have to make adjustments, you know, with the speed. It seems like markets have been continuously speeding up since the discount, discount broker, you know, dropped the commissions. You know, the trends were so much more solid back in the, you know, 70s and early 80s when there were full commission uh, brokers where it was $100 to trade, a, trade one stock one time and inflation adjusted, that was a lot of money. So you didn't see all the, the extreme volatility and reactions in both directions as you do nowadays. So I think as the commission and the barrier to entry gets lower and lower, that the market price action will get faster and faster and people will have no trouble, you know, trading with volume in both directions. So I think it's just going to speed up the market and deteriorate trends. Yeah, I, I think that that can happen as well, but it does reduce the barrier to entry on some strategies that maybe some smaller account traders had, you know, paying stock commissions at 10 bucks for a hundred shares. Now it's gone. So let's say you are working with smaller accounts. You might not have to go into options to get the cheaper rate or the leverage. Maybe you can play stocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, What's funny about that is I, I've been trading almost commission free since 2007, 2007 with uh, Merrill, Merrill Lynch edge and bank of America since 2007. Now they give me, uh, they had given me a hundred free trades a month even before this happened because of my size of accounts I keep with them. So I've been trading almost commission free now for 12 years. Mm -hmm. Do you think it'll affect the way you teach people at all? 
Because I, I don't see anything really. I mean, I was asked this question myself recently, and I, I didn't have an answer to it. So I don't see any real change in the way you yeah. approach markets, do you? It, it just cuts the expenses for the small people. Small people now don't have to worry about being eaten up so much by commission costs like they used to with small accounts. I think it's going to help small accounts be able to trade more actively without the drawdown from the deterioration because of the commission expense. Yeah. Uh, next thing I wanted to ask you about is what your market opinion is right now. And obviously we know, you know, we don't know the future, right? Uh, we trade what with the information we have in front of us right now. We're heading to, into Q4 where you've got trade war news headlines still dominating, just like they have been for the last 18 months, right? Uh, you've got a Federal Reserve that uh, is now debating whether they should cut or hold, and they seem to be wanting to cut and just continue to, to have quantitative easing forever, it feels like. And then you've got, also got last year where the market crashed 25%. Uh, what is your expectation for the market uh, this quarter and then into 2020? Yeah, you know, and like we talked about, I will trade my technical signals. And right now I've got, I had a bunch of bullish dip buys into the oversold areas on the recent uh, test of a 200 day moving average in a lot of individual stocks. But uh, I believe just from a, you know, for fun, you know, from a poker player perspective that the, uh, that their China will have to make a deal with the U.S. before the election. I don't think they can take this pressure for that long a period of time. I think that will trigger a whole new leg up. If it happens, I think there's a very high probability chance. I also think that the Fed will be forced to cut rates due to the uh, manufacturing data coming back so poorly and the slowing growth of jobs, even though the job creation is still a great number, it's uh, slowing its trend. So I think the Fed's pushed into a corner of having to lower rates and the well, China's going to have to make a deal. And that's going to that's gonna be very bullish. Steve, I have a question for you. All right. Uh, first of all, I've loved listening to this. I've been on the edge of my seat. <laughs> not just proverbially, like literally. Uh, all right, so you have this premise, this thought through logical premise, and you've said that you trade about 95% on the technicals, like you're pretty much a technician. Yes. So how do, how do you like, uh, how much does your opinion that you develop and these like a thesis on what China will do influence, does it influence the type of trades you'll be looking to do? Or do you ever use them to actually help trigger in like, how do you use the thesis and your, and your intelligence and your thought process in what's going on in the world um, on the entry points of your trades? I don't anymore. <laughs> but so you have this <laughs> – and that's what I thought you would say. <laughs> but, I, I, you know, it's a fun game to look at. I, you know, I enjoyed the 2008 meltdown. I think I was up 4% that year watching the show, but I was never taking any trades based on that. But yet, I've learned not to follow my opinions. You know, whatever the price action takes me, whatever my signals say, I will follow them because I've got parameters that will measure the momentum and the and the uh, speed of trends, and I will stay in the direction of the uh, the direction of least resistance is the direction I'll stay in. But but it is fun to talk about and speculate. But I would never risk money based on my opinions. Yeah, I think it's one of the biggest risks out there. I've seen people who, uh, over the course of my career, some of the biggest meltdowns I've seen personal traders have is when they're convinced of a worldview that the economy is going to hell or the economy is going to run or it's going to be good or bad or they hated Obama or they loved Obama <laughs> or they hated Trump or they loved Trump. And they're so convinced of their worldview, they end up trading their money based on their opinion <clears throat> and they just get caught on the wrong side of it. Yeah, the, the two best examples of that is the uh, run off of the March 2009 lows after Obama came in. Everyone, like you said, had so many, and me too, I thought, well, this isn't going to be good. And it ended up being one of the biggest bull market runs ever uh, during his term, getting back to where we started before 2008. And then also after Trump became president, the Dow futures crashed a thousand points overnight. And then they rally back, gap up and take off on a tear. I mean, there's no way to anybody would know everything everybody's going to do and react to price action price action begets more price action and no one has any idea what the composite of everyone's going to do they better just go with the fat of least resistance you know it reminds me of uh the mindset jesse livermore talked about in the greatest trading book ever written uh, reminiscences of a mm -hmm. stock operator where he says opinions are often wrong Mar our markets never are right you know it, it, this is not a new thing with human beings we've always thought we have a perspective that is correct but it's not necessarily accurate the market doesn't care who you voted for the market doesn't care if you're right, left, or center. The market doesn't care who won the football games yesterday. They care about money, and the, the trends and the signals on the chart are what matters the most. Yeah. And it's an equal opportunity. Uh, it'll let you win or lose. <laughs>
equal yeah. opportunity employer. What's the best thing about getting people to know how to do this? I mean, what, what gives you uh, a lot of value? Where do you, because you're a teacher, you're an educator, you're a trader, you could just trade your own accounts, but you decide to teach people and write books and talk about the subject. You're on Twitter every day. You clearly have a passion for teaching the content as well as uh, investing and trading for yourself. So what do you love the most about that? You know, it's an, I enjoy, uh, you know, people not going down the wrong road or losing a lot of money or their accounts. I mean, that's the, most people come to me after they've lost half of their trading account or blown up. And it's just sad to see people that, you know, they just want to, you know, participate in the markets and make money either for their family or uh, to try to seek financial independence from their uh, job or because they're passionate about the game. And it's just sad to see people go in the wrong path and go through so much pain with uh, not understanding the math of the position sizing and the risk or even just the realities of the math of what they're trying to do. I mean, trying to trade for a living, be undercapitalized, you know, have no idea what they're doing and putting their family at risk or their home at risk. Or it's just sad. Yeah. Yeah. I think correcting some of that, uh, you know, helping people actually achieve reasonable financial goals, getting on a process to where they can do it forever. I mean, those are things that I get a lot of value out of too. And you're right. I mean, sometimes we are having to kind of assess a, a bad situation and get people to start over. You know, one of the biggest challenges I've ever had as an educator is when people deal with extreme results before they get trained. Right. And I mean, extreme on both sides. I remember a couple of times where I was mentoring some people who had made a lot of money and Steve, I knew it cause I'm an expert. They would made a lot of money getting lucky, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they'd made a lot of money in the short term. They ran their accounts way up. And I, I I'll never forget this one conversation I had with a, with a woman. And I said, listen, you're going to lose all your money eventually. If you do it this way consistently, mm -hmm. mathematically, I know that. And she just giggled at me and laughed. Yep. And says, oh, you're just being the old fuddy duddy. <laughs> that's a challenge, yeah. right? I mean, and then the other one is when they've had financial, you know, disaster, maybe they've, uh, you know, over leveraged into leverage products and taken big drawdowns and they know they want to trade, but they've gone through the crisis already and you're trying to help them out of it. And it can be a tough uh, haul on both regards. Um, what do you think is more difficult getting somebody to back off of the greed when they've had it or getting somebody <laughs> back up and running after they've had uh, kind of financial disaster? I think back up and running because it's, you know, not only do you have the risk of ruin financially with your money, but you have the risk of a, a mental and emotional ruin. You know, you, you, first time you blow up, you, you are ruined. You don't think you're doing it to make money. If you lose all your money, that's not what you're doing it for. So that's what causes probably 90% you know, plus of traders to quit. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's obviously a lot more difficult to, to bring people back up into a confident state and trading well. Cause then, uh, I mean, a lot of times what happens is when you start showing them what reasonable returns are, they, they get deflated and uh, it doesn't matter what your past experience is though. Math is math. You know, it doesn't matter if you lost 50% last year or you made 50%, your targets moving forward should be based on sound principles. And you got to understand what the market can bear. And the only way you increase your rates of return uh, into the astronomical levels is if you take too much risk on and you can do a lot easier returns with better strategies in my opinion. You know, Steve, it's been a pleasure talking to you here today. I could literally just sit and chat with you all day long. Uh, what's one message you would want to give our audience out there? We've got traders from all over the country. We've got some from all over the world. Uh, and many of our team, you know, they've been with us for years. You know, we've been doing this podcast now five years and uh, we've got a loyal audience out there. What's something you'd like them to, to think about uh, as we wrap up this interview? You know, the, the key to successful trading is, you know, not to start trading until you have a quantified trading system with an edge that you believe in. It fits your uh, risk tolerance and, re and reward goals, and, uh, and you can trade over the long term. I mean, until you have that, it's best not to, not to begin. Yeah. So, which means you're going to have to embrace numbers. I, I apologize <laughs> out there, but numbers do matter. There is no doubt about it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Before you guys finish up, I just have to say as a consumer of the last half hour of content, I could listen to you two guys talk all day long. Yeah, but the markets are going to close. So we got to, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, but seriously, like, like it was abs you guys just, I loved that conversation. Holy cow. I loved it. I think there might be a correlation because Mark, I know you also love numbers. So you might, we might be talking right down your alley. Right no, now. no. Like seriously, like this thing, res I'm going to re I have never re-listened to a podcast segment other than quality assurance. 
I'm going to re-listen to this one for my own personal enjoyment. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> Our podcast producer here, Steve, he's never listened back to one of the episodes. I guess we're just assuming they all. I had to throw in for quality <laughs> assurance just to make sure you guys knew I was doing my job. You know. Uh, I love it. I love it, Steve. Thank you for being there. Uh, how ma- how can people get in contact with you? What are some social channels that, that you'd want them to follow you on? Things like that. Uh, yeah, Twitter. My most popular one is the uh, S Joseph Burns on a Twitter. And then a new trader U, the letter U is my primary blog and website. And from there, you can uh, connect to anything else that I have. Awesome. Awesome. We'll have you on anytime here, Steve. Thanks for being here, guys. We're going to be back uh, after this short break from Coach Mark. TJ. Bye, guys.